Hot building successful collaborations with health data. Okay, Always. thank you. Uh, so my name is Tempest van Skyk. I am a machine learning engineer at Microsoft, um, working with, uh, with healthcare data. Um, just the usual disclaimer, um, I'm going to be talking about my personal views, not necessarily the views of my employer. Um, so I'm going to talk about building successful collaborations with health data because I have witnessed an increasing uh, growing interest in uh, working with health data and building uh, machine learning projects with healthcare data. Um, so I'm hoping to give some, some um, kind of advice and insights that you can use in, in your projects um, if anyone is interested in health data here. Um, so we'll take a look at uh, first understanding what makes healthcare data quite so tricky and unique and interesting. Uh, then we'll look at um, this, this important point of data people like us relying on medical experts. And lastly, we'll look at some of the cultural differences between sort of data tech people and, and healthcare people and how we can better understand those differences um, and, and play nicely together in our collaborations. Um, so first of all, let's take a look at what makes health data quite so tricky. Um, so the most obvious thing that comes to mind is the sensitivity of healthcare data. Um, and when we're working with this data, security is really important, um, as we saw in the, the talk prior, prior, prior to this one. Um, it's really important to um, work securely with that data, maintain the privacy of, of uh, the people in your data set. And um, often healthcare data can be tied to consent. Um, so I've experienced working with uh, genomic data where someone had consented to have their data used for cardiovascular research. Um, and we couldn't use that data for cancer research because um, their consent had specifically outlined only one type of research. So that's another interesting aspect. Um, Obviously, the consequences of the decisions we make with healthcare data are extremely serious. So if we use healthcare data to train a machine learning model to determine how long somebody should wait until they get their treatment or um, how, much, how much we should spend on somebody's treatment or which treatment they should get, those are obviously very serious uh, decisions. Um, data is not the new oil. Uh, there was this saying a couple of years ago, the data is the new oil, and I think it's very regrettable. Uh, health data in particular is very, very precious. And uh, we're extremely privileged if we are, if we get the opportunity to work with healthcare data. Um, and I've noticed this very um, um, acutely when working with clinical trial data, where you feel very grateful for each participant in your trial, um, and for the, and you really treat that data as a precious um, precious uh, uh, gift, I suppose. Um, and in fact, for the average clinical trial, phase one registered on clinicaltrials.gov, that includes around 75 patients where, and each one costs $15,000 to recruit and to look after on the trial. Continued, more things that make data tricky. Um, it exists in a non-digital form very often. Um, and so we can't do exciting machine learning unless it has been digitized. Um, and that goes on to the quality of medical data. Um, when it is digitized, it's often missing or poorly captured. But um, if we think about um, why this is the case, we may be a bit more sympathetic. So as data scientists, it's frustrating to have missing values, but um, imagine a nurse in a busy ER um, their, their priority is not entering uh, data correctly, it's to save lives. Um, now, labeling health data for the point, purpose of training uh, is particularly difficult. Um, when we have images of, uh, it's easy to label them as cat or dog, but when we have a panel of healthcare data, it's very difficult to define what makes someone healthy and someone not healthy. Um, so that labeling is often one of the most difficult parts of a health data project and um, one of the only health outcomes that everyone can agree on is whether someone is alive or not. 
Um, data requires a huge amount of expertise. Health data requires a huge amount of expertise to understand, um, and we can't just kind of walk into it and get going. Um, so here I'm showing that there are a huge amount of published machine learning algorithms in existence. And there's a smaller set of those that are actually useful algorithms that solve a useful problem. And then an even smaller set of those are algorithms that make it into medical clinical practice. Uh, because there's a lot of uh, barriers along the way, a lot of um, uh, regulation, for example. Um, and then even smaller set is uh, algorithms that are available in clinical practice and are actually used. So the last stumbling block can often be usability and user experience. Um, I've had an experience where I was in a surgery wearing scrubs and I handed a device, a medical device to a surgeon and they kind of tried it out, didn't like it, gave it back to me um, because it wasted a couple of seconds and they just don't have seconds to waste. Uh, and when you're designing apps for clinicians, um, if they're used to clicking once and you make them click twice, they may not actually use it because their time is very, very uh, precious. So we've had a look at um, what makes medical data and medical um, algorithms so tricky. Uh, so now I want to talk about how important it is for data people like us to rely on medical experts. So I would say that we should be aware of health data publications that have no health experts on them. And I've seen this even in, in journals like Nature, where computer scientists will get hold of some real medical data, uh, do an analysis and publish their conclusions without ever consulting with relevant healthcare um, experts. And, and some of the healthcare experts in that I've spoken to have been really, um, really shocked and disappointed because the results are not right. Um, they, the computer scientists just, just did not have the context and it's embarrassing. So let's all avoid doing that. Um, however, that doesn't mean that you should just uh, get a doctor on your publication for the sake of it. Um, so this is a kind of a common question that gets posed to me uh, by people who are starting their healthcare data um, projects. So they said, how do you recommend collaborating with doctors when the time comes to write the actual paper? I made a network that detects tumors, but I'm not sure how to split the paper with the doctor. Okay, so this is, this is the wrong approach. You don't just include the expert at the end. It's really important to have that domain expertise at the beginning. Um, and another thing I would say is to make sure you're solving a real problem. Um, and if you had collaborated with um, a, a medical expert from the beginning, you could have checked, um, do they need a network that detects tumors? Um, is, that a, is that a real problem or one that you kind of just assumed or made up? Um, so I've, it's important for us as data people to um, collaborate in a multidisciplinary team. It's not just us uh, data people. Um, there's also, so there's data scientists, there's software engineers that actually put models into production, maybe user experience designers and product developers. And these are the kind of tech people on the left. Then we have clinical researchers. They might be in a university or maybe in an R&D department of a pharmaceutical company. Um, people who play a data governance role, uh, maybe regulators like the FDA or the Institutional Review Board of the university. And then on the other side of the wall, the healthcare professionals and patients who are all stakeholders. And I've drawn them on the other side of the wall because often us tech people um, don't have direct contact with patients or even doctors. We often go through some sort of clinical researcher. I'm going to just highlight um, these, these stakeholders. So, so I'm going to lump them as sort of the tech people and the medical experts. So when entering a uh, collaboration, it's important that data scientists and software engineers are humble and respectful of domain expertise. Um, and this has been, it's been quite interesting during this um, coronavirus pandemic uh, to see that suddenly everyone is an epidemiologist. So software engineers and data scientists get hold of some code, run some models, and then have strong opinions about epidemiology they sometimes go against the experts that have been in studying this field for, for decades. Um, 
and I, it's important for, for, for tech people not to judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. So when we enter into a collaboration, if we judge um, our collaborators, the medical experts, on their use of technology um, uh, and fail to see the expertise that they bring to the collaboration, um, that, is a, that is a big failure. Um, so I've noticed um, uh, also during coronavirus, there's been a very uh, world-leading epidemiologist who has had his code um, uh, criticized uh, very publicly um, by software engineers who are saying that his whole epidemiological model is wrong because they don't like the look of his code. Um, so here's a screenshot of a tweet saying that he should have used expressive class names. They don't like the way his arguments are passed. Um, he has amateur dev traits. The code has a lack of modularity and so on. Um, but that doesn't mean that he's not an expert in his field and someone uh, that we can learn from. So that's not the right attitude to go into a collaboration with. Um, so I'm going to mention one a project I've worked on recently uh, with health data. And this is called Project Physio. Uh, Physio is an ongoing study of children with cystic fibrosis. Uh, cystic fibrosis is a very serious genetic disease, mainly affecting the lungs. And children that are affected, um, the main way that the disease is treated is to uh, do these coughing and uh, exhalation exercises to clear their lungs of mucus and to actually cough up the mucus every day. And it's a very demanding um, kind of physiotherapy to do. Uh, so we have a collaboration uh, between Microsoft and the UCL Institute of Child Health and Great Ormond Street Hospital, uh, where a team at Microsoft developed um, custom sensors, custom pressure, pressure sensors, to go into this device that the children ex do their exhalation physiotherapy into, and custom video games as well. Uh, and the pressure sensor actually controls the characters in the video games. And our hope is that gamifying this physiotherapy will make it less of a burden on the children. Um, because some of the children actually dislike their physiotherapy more than they dislike having this very serious disease. Um, and so my team uh, did the kind of data analysis of this study and set up the pipeline for processing this huge amount of data huge amount of time series data that's coming out. Um, and what I've shown here is sort of um, clusters of breaths where the child does their breathing and then pauses to cough and then does their breathing and so on. Um, and I think this was a particularly successful collaboration because the clinicians we worked with were highly engaged in data science. Um, so as, long, as well as myself as a data scientist, we also had software engineers that help um, sort of build the pipelines and put this into production. And experts uh, being uh, experts in child health, in cystic fibrosis and in physiotherapy. And they actually attended all of our engineering daily stand-ups and all of our weekly meetings too, um, which is incredible. I've never had such a huge amount of engagement um, from clinicians. And uh, that was great because we were able to involve them in every decision about every data point that gets excluded or every feature that is used or not used in analysis. So now I'm going to talk about um, some of the cultural differences I've observed between uh, tech people and medical experts um, and advice about how we can all work well together. Um, so one major cultural difference is how we view technology and risk and progress. Uh, I think as technologists, we uh, think of new technology as um, something that will improve our lives, um, something exciting, um, something to work towards as a sign of progress. Um, but I did a project with a, a medical regulator that, whose, whose concern is patient safety. And they had a very different worldview, which was fascinating. They, when they approve a new medical device um, to be used, they just see um, new accidents that will happen, new ways that the device could malfunction or be um, used in unexpected ways. And they just see a kind of a flood of new, new accidents and new harms happening. Um, so they want, they, they want to keep patients safe. 
and uh, so that's a very different worldview, uh, which I thought was quite gives quite an interesting insight into the way that this community thinks. Um, move fast and break things is a phrase that was popular in tech and startups. Um, however, you can see it's so so different to the medical community, where which moves very slowly, very cautiously, and does not want to break anything, especially um, healthcare. So how, how, how can we be good collaborators? Uh, so I think medical researchers should be engaged and curious and open to learning, trying to do things in a different way, trying out new technology, um, ideally able to commit time. I know it's very precious, but the more time they can put in, the better. Um, I'd like to see more medical organizations investing in in-house data skills. So I don't mean doctors learning Python. I mean, medical organizations, R&D departments, hiring data scientists and data analysts um, so that they can take ownership of the analysis uh, rather than collecting data and giving it to another organization to, to analyze. Um, and then finally, I, I can say this having spent time in academia, not letting perfect get in the way of progress. So often, um, researchers are kind of overwhelmed by the complexity of the disease area that they work in. And I feel like engineers are quite good at coming in, breaking down a problem and starting to build something simple first, uh, just to get going. Uh, for the tech people, um, I would say that we are responsible for using data in an ethical way. Um, so. It's extremely valuable to have um, uh, lawyers, sociologists, philosophers um, who, who are experts in ethics uh, involved in this conversation. But it's also crucial that data scientists have a seat at the table because we understand the data and the algorithms and the limitations of them and what they can do better than anyone else. So it's really important that we're actively involved in this discussion and that we um flag any um anything in our work which does not seem ethical that's really is our responsibility um, we should be humble respectful and relying on domain expertise engineers in particular should not be judging a fish by its ability to climb a tree uh, we should be inviting researchers to meetings and planning documents and right into our code repo so that they see what we're doing and are involved in our decisions they should be patient in a tech phobic environment because we understand why the environment is conservative and cautious. Data scientists should be prepared for messy real world data and they should be prepared to balance um, statistical or machine learning metrics with what the clinician wants and what makes sense to the clinician. And data scientists should be obsessed with building something useful. Um, so hopefully that overview was 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 useful um, and hopefully what you take away from this talk is that um, medical health data is is tricky for a, ver a number of reasons um, that data people must include medical experts in their projects from the beginning and that you can expect some cultural differences between collaborators on a project uh, and if you recognize them, hopefully we can all play our role um, in, in collaborating nicely together. Thank you. Um, you can find me on Twitter and you can find out about my team at this URL on the left and um, about our open jobs too. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tempest, for that lovely presentation.